Well, good morning. morning. You all know i got to make you do it again. Good morning. Good morning. It is great to see each and every one of you here. If this is your first time with us at the Hill, thank you so much for coming to worship with us. You've made our day. If you've not seen our guest services table, there's a little card you can fill out just to help us connect with you some more. But, man, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to preach. Again, y'all keep our pastor, Brother Reggie, in your prayers. He's in Richmond preaching. Guys, I just want to encourage you to keep our community in your prayers. As many of you all know, there was a tragic accident last night, and many of you all here at the church have, are directly affected by that. And so from here at the Hill, our deepest sympathy are, is with you, and our deepest sincere prayers are with you as well. But we're going to continue on in the book of Philippians this morning. Man, Philippians has been an amazing book to to open together as a body of believers, just to talk about what Paul was divinely inspired to write to the church of Philippi. When you remember that Paul is writing this letter to the Philippian church from a jail cell, Philippians is known as a book of joy. In the midst of Paul's circumstance, in the midst of him being in jail, not knowing if he was going to be released, not knowing if he was going to to be put to death, he writes this book to encourage the church at Philippi. And in the midst of being in jail, in the midst of his circumstance, he remained joyful. And so this morning, I want to talk about the root of joy and how we can shift our perspective from our circumstance to our calling. In the midst of Paul's circumstance in prison, we know Paul went through so much for the sake of the gospel. Remember, Paul was the one who persecuted Christians. He was the one who imprisoned Christians, who even had a hand in putting Christians to death. And if you remember, on the road to Damascus, he was transformed by the gospel and spent the remainder of his life preaching and teaching the gospel. And Paul suffered greatly so that the gospel could be advanced. Not only was he put in prison many times, but he was beaten, he was shipwrecked. He went through so much in order for the gospel to be advanced. And so what I see here as we continue on in Philippians chapter number one is Paul's perspective. His perspective that went not only from his circumstance, but he looked past his circumstance. And he remembered the calling that God had placed on his life. So he didn't allow the circumstance that he was going through. He didn't allow the circumstances that he had already been through to hinder him fulfilling God's will for his life. And I'm here to tell you all this morning, each and every one of you has a purpose. You all are here on purpose. God created you with a purpose on purpose. Each one of you are breathing. You're here. You're alive. You still have purpose. God has a calling on each and every one of our lives. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've never trusted Him by faith, if you do not know the gospel, the good news of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, God's calling on your life now is to accept the free gift of salvation that is offered to each and every one of us. And if you have accepted this free gift of salvation... If you've trusted Jesus by faith, He has a calling on your life to continue sharing the gospel with everyone. So what is your calling? Some of you may be thinking, well, Bo, I'm not a preacher. I'm, I don't lead a youth group. I'm no theologian. I'm just me. Well, that's what God's calling on your life is to be you. And allow Him to use you right where you're at to spread His word. I don't know my calling. I don't know what it is specifically that God wants me to do. You know, a lot of times, and especially in youth ministry, we get so caught up and we emphasize what does God want me to do for the rest of my life to the point where we forget that God has the same calling on every believer. What is this calling? I'm glad you asked. So go ye therefore into all the world to preach and teach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to baptize believers and to make 
disciples. You know that phrase, that go ye therefore, that means as you go. As you live your life, you ought to be sharing the gospel. That is his calling on each and every one of our lives as a believer. So what is my calling? Well, to realize God has allowed me to be where I'm at as a platform to fulfill the Great Commission. That's our calling. That's our duty. That's our obligation as a disciple if you know Jesus as your Savior. So some of you may be struggling. Well, I don't know what it is he specifically wants me to do, but where are you at right now? Are you a husband? Are you a wife? Are you a mother? Are you a father? Are you a brother? Are you a son? Are you a daughter? Are you a sister? Wherever you're at, a co-worker. God has allowed you to be where you're at right now as a calling to spread the gospel. If you're a husband, how are you leading your family to know Jesus more? If you're a wife, how are you doing that as well? If you're a mother, how are you leading your children to know Jesus more? It's saying to you as a father, as a co-worker, the people that you're around every day, how are you presenting the gospel to them? That's our calling. And so what Paul doesn't allow himself to do is allow his circumstance to hinder him fulfilling the calling that God placed on his life. And so what I want to encourage you all with this morning is not do that as well. Do not allow your circumstance where you're at to get your eyes off of Jesus, to get your eyes off of what it is that God has you doing now. We all go through different things some of you are carrying some baggage with you this morning. Don't allow whatever burden you have on your life to hinder you from fulfilling God's will for your life. Paul didn't allow the circumstance of him being in prison to stop him from edifying this church. He was concerned about them. He wasn't concerned about himself. And we're going to find that as we read throughout, uh, the, not the remainder of this chapter, but some verses in here. We're not going to finish chapter one yet. We might be here for a while. You want to know how Brother Ed, God's calling in his life. There's a quote. This guy, his name is Alistair McGrath. I never heard of Alistair McGrath until I started studying a little bit. This guy's from Ireland. He is a theologian. He's a scientist, and he's also an apologist. Now, what is an apologist? Well, he's a defender of the faith. He's a very intellectual guy. And as I was studying Philippians, I found this quote that he, he talks about. He, as he studied Philippians, here's what he found. Now, I'm just going to read the first half of this quote, and we'll finish the rest of, this, of the quote as we get through this message. But here's what he says. He says, when it comes to Philippians, it is one of the most positive and delightful of Paul's letters. One of the most positive and delightful of Paul's letters, even while he was in prison. So Philippians chapter number 1, we'll start with verse number 19, and we'll conclude down to verse 26. Here's what Paul authors by divine inspiration. Verse number 19, Because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me, and I don't know which one I should choose. I am torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus may abound. Can you see what's going on here with Paul? What did he just get through saying? Because he starts out in verse number 19, he says, because. So what did he say before? If you remember the past couple weeks, Brother Reggie had talked about the joy in the opposition. Remember, the, 
the verses he had just authored, he said that there were people that were preaching Christ with ill intent. Out of envy, out of strife. But he was saying, I rejoice because even though they didn't have the right motivation, they were still preaching Christ. And he said, I rejoice in this. And a couple weeks ago, we see that Paul was talking about how because he was in prison, the imperial guard of Caesar was getting saved. Paul was preaching the gospel. He was saying, yes. I may be in a bad circumstance. I may be in prison. I may not make it, but listen, it's all okay because people are getting saved. God has allowed me to be here because there's people I can reach in here. And I'm here to tell you all this morning, there's people you can reach. There's people I can reach. I may not reach the people you can reach, and you may not be able to reach the people that I can reach. But listen, God has you right where you're at because he knows that you are able to reach those in your life. So don't allow the circumstance that you may be facing right now to hinder you from that. And so what Paul has been saying is, yes, I'm in prison. Yes, I may be facing death. Yes, this may not look good. But God is using it for the good because there's people getting saved. There's people that may have never heard the gospel if I wouldn't have been in prison. And yes, there may be people that are opposing me. They may be preaching Christ out of envy or strife. But Christ is still being preached, and in that I rejoice. So he goes on and he says, because of this, I know this will lead to my salvation, or in other words, his vindication. You see, Paul had an expectation to be released from prison because he knew there was more work to be done. He had been fighting the good fight in prison. He had been spreading the gospel in prison, but he knew there was still more work to be done. And so because of this, he knew and had a hope, an eager expectation to be released from prison soon. Not because of himself, not because of who he was, but notice what he says. He says, through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He says, because of the gospel being preached, I know this can lead to my vindication, my salvation from prison. I have an eager expectation. I have a hope to be released because there's more work to be done. And I can do this through the power of Jesus and also through the prayers of the church. Did you all know that there's power in prayer? There is power in prayer. There is power in in prayer. When I begin to pray, whenever I begin to pray to the Lord and seek Him, my faith begins to be exercised. And I begin to seek God for the things of God. Because there's power in prayer. We see God does a work when His people pray. When His people pray. Anybody ever heard of the man by the name of Charles Spurgeon? Anybody? He's known as Prince of Preachers. I mean, he was a preaching machine. He was a pastor in London, England in the 19th century. And he is known by having great ministry success. He is known to be faithful to the ministry, faithful to preaching the word. He was a great theologian. And he had great ministry success. And one day, there was this group of, of young ministers who came to visit his church. They just wanted to talk to him. They wanted just to glean wisdom from Charles Spurgeon. They wanted to know, man, what, what's your theology? How do you do this in the church? What's your ministry model for this? They just came just to glean some knowledge from him because he was a very successful minister. He has seen people get saved. His church exploded. And he had seen God do a work in his ministry. And so these young ministers come to talk to him. And he begins to show them around the church, show them all the seating, talk about the ministries they do. But that wasn't what he really wanted to talk to them about. He said, I want to show you guys my boiler room. I want to show you guys the room where it really heats this church up. They're like, oh, why would we want to see a room like that? Like, why do we want to go to the furnace? Like, what are you talking about? It's like, no, I, I want to show you what really heats this place up. 
So he takes them down a set of steps. They get to the store, and he's like, this is my boiler room. This is what heats this place up. He opens the door up. There's hundreds of congregation members praying. And what he tells people is that he had been interviewed so many times about his ministry success. He said, you know what gives my ministry success? Why, why am I successful? My people pray. Nothing to do with me. I'm just faithful to what God is calling me to do. It's because the church prays. Guys, there is power in prayer. We begin to see God do a work and a move when we seek His face. So are we going to be a people of prayer? You know why we've seen people saved here on this hill? Because we've had people praying. We've had people seeking the face of Almighty God. Will we be a people of prayer? Because there's power in prayer. There's a story in Acts chapter number 12. Peter is put in prison. He was going to be killed. And he was chained. And he had to be asleep in between two prison guards. And what we find in Acts chapter number 12 in verse number 5, verse number 5 tells us that the church prayed fervently for Peter. And what happens that night is extraordinary. An angel comes. He breaks Peter out of prison. He was set free from his bondage, from his chains, because there's power in prayer. So I encourage this church, I encourage the people here at the hill to be a people of prayer. Prayer changes things. And, and this was Paul's eager expectation. He says, because of the gospel being preached, I know that this will lead to my salvation. I have an eager hope and an eager expectation to escape prison because of the help of Jesus, but also the help of the prayers of God's people. Because Paul's concern was the advancement of the gospel. This was where his joy was found. It wasn't in a circumstance. It wasn't in the mountaintops. It wasn't that he be famous. It was that Jesus was made famous. It was the gospel being preached. That was the root of his joy. That's where his joy was found. In verse 20, he says this, that his eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or or by death. So what Paul was saying was that no matter what he had to face for the sake of the gospel, no matter what he had to endure, as long as the gospel was being preached, he wanted to be found faithful in that. Whether he was in prison or whether he was out of prison, whether he was free or whether he was bound by chains, if he was shipwrecked or if everything was going good, he said, I wanted to be found Faithful in presenting the gospel. Because that was his motivation. That's what he invested his life in. He knew God had called him to preach the gospel. And listen, we're no different than Paul. You see, sometimes, and this has been my temptation when I study scripture. I read about these people and I think, man, they're superhuman. They have something I don't have. I mean, we read about them in Scripture. Look at all the mighty things they did. But they were no different than each and every one of us. They were sold out for the sake of the gospel. Remember who Paul was. He was Saul of Tarsus. He hated Christians. But we see God transformed his life, transformed his heart. And we see Paul sold out for Jesus sold out to preach the gospel and we can all be the same way but what is our motivation what are we sold out for is it the gospel he was he, he says this in Romans chapter number 12 verse 1 he says therefore brothers and sisters I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God this is your true worship this is your true worship. You realize that worship isn't just when we sing songs, right? 
Worship is how we live our life. Worship is just as much giving to the church as it is when I raise my hands when I sing praises. Worship is service. Worship is what Paul says. He says it's offering yourself as a living sacrifice to God. He says this is your true worship. What is true worship? I lay down my life because Jesus laid down his life for me. I surrender my all because Jesus surrendered his life for me. It's giving my life back to the Lord, saying, God, use me however you want, wherever you want, no matter what I may have to face, no matter what I may have to endure, I worship you, I lay myself down. And Paul says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your reasonable service because of what Jesus has done for you, and it's also your true worship. Notice what he says in verse 21. He says, for me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I like how the NLT puts this, the New Living Translation. It says this, for me, living means living for Christ. So what was Paul saying? He was saying, while I have breath, while I'm still alive, while I'm living my life, I'm living it for Christ. It's all that matters. If I can escape prison, and if God would allow me to live some more days, I'm devoting them to Him. But notice what he says. He says, living means living for Christ. But dying is even better. How could Paul have such confidence in this? How could Paul be so confident while in prison? Notice, if you all have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Chapter number 5, 2 Corinthians. Same author, Paul, is writing to the church of Corinth. Paul is talking about his or our future after death. Remember, he says, for me, if I live, it means I'm living for Christ. But dying is even better. He says this, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. For we know that if our earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal dwelling in the heavens, not made with hands. Indeed, we groan in this tent, desiring to put on our heavenly dwelling. Since we have taken it off, we will not be found naked. Indeed, we groan while we are in this tent, but burdened as we are, because we do not want to be unclothed, but clothed, so that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who prepared us for this very purpose is God who gave us the Spirit as a down payment. So we are always confident and know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. In fact, we are confident and we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Therefore, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to be pleasing to Him. So what is Paul saying to the church at Corinth? He says, I've got a future awaiting me. I'm in this earthly tent in my flesh, in my body. But there's something far greater that I'm going to experience one day. My Savior has gone on to prepare a place for me. Remember what Jesus told his disciples? He says, i got to prepare a place for you. And if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you this. What has Jesus done for us? Not only did he lay his life down, Freely to offer us the free gift of salvation. Not only did he raise victorious over death, hell, sin, and the grave. Not only can he give you a life more abundant while you live on this earth, but he has promised you eternal life. He has gone on to prepare a place for every believer. And this was Paul's confidence. So why was Paul so confident while he was in prison? His faith. We see the faith of a disciple here. 
He says, if I live, that means I'm going to live for Christ. But if I die, what's it matter? I'm good. Dying is even better. Why? Because I'm going to be with Jesus. My Savior has gone on to prepare a place for me. And I want to see Him. So if I have to face death for the sake of the gospel, wouldn't that be the best way? If I die, he says, it's all the game. Why? Because my faith will be made silent. I'll get to see the one who died for me. I'll get to walk the streets of gold. I'll get to be with Jesus throughout all eternity. So if I live, good. If I die, man, that's even better. Notice what he goes on to say. He says this. Verse number 22. He says, Now if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. And I don't know which one I should choose. I'm torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. So not only do we see the faith of a disciple here, but we see the fight within a disciple. Do you notice this internal conflict that was going on with Paul? On one hand, I want to go on to be with Jesus. I want to see my Savior. I want to be in heaven. I want to be in the presence of God. And that's far better for me. But on the other hand, there's more work to be done here. Notice what he says. He says, I'm torn between the two. There's this internal conflict we see within a disciple of Jesus. I want to be with Jesus. I want to go on. I want to be in heaven to be with my Lord. I want to be in the presence of God. But I also know there's work to be done. There is something in, inside every believer, every disciple. There's this deep yearning to be with Jesus. This want to. I want to be with Jesus. I want to see my Savior. I want to experience heaven. Anybody ever heard of the Kidney Chesney song, Everybody Want to Go to Heaven, Nobody Want to Go Now? I used to hate that song. Man, I would, when it would come on the radio, turn the radio off, I was like, man, that's blasphemy. That's heretical. Kenny Chesney, what are you doing? Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to go now. You kind of see this fight in Paul. I want to go to heaven. I want to see Jesus. But I don't really need to go now. Because there's more work to be done. There's this deep yearning inside every disciple. That is the same fight. Anybody struggle with this conflict inside yourself? I want to see Jesus. I want to be with Him. I want to spend eternity with Him. I want to go on and see the streets of gold, worship God forever. I want to see my faith become my sight. I want to look into the eyes of the one who died for me. But there's still so much for me to do now. You see, when you got saved, God could have went ahead and called you home. Salvation could have just been the end. You trust in Christ and you're transported to heaven. But salvation isn't the end. Eternal life isn't the end. It's just the beginning. It is just the beginning. Because now we can walk with Jesus hand in hand, living the abundant life, doing the work of the ministry that He calls each and every one of us to do. He calls each and every one of us as ministers of reconciliation. It's not just the ones that stand up here and preaches the word that are preachers. We're all called to be ministers of the gospel. We all have that calling. Some of us get so worried about what does God specifically want me to do for the rest of my life? Does he want me to be a preacher? Does he want me to be a teacher? Does he want me to be a missionary? Does he want me to serve the military? Does he, and these are all good things. But God has a general will calling on every believer. And whatever you do specifically with your life, he demands and requires you to use this calling to preach the gospel wherever you're placed. And so this is this yearning, this internal conflict that Paul is having to deal with and what he's addressing with the church at Philippi. 
I want to be with Jesus. But there's more work to be done. Notice his humility though. He says in verse 23 that he longs to depart and be with Christ. Which is far better. Verse 24. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ. Why are we setting this church up to have multi campuses? Listen, Russell Springs is just the beginning, y'all. That's exciting. Why are we doing that? Because there's more work to be done. Why do we have basketball practices every Tuesday and basketball games on Saturdays? Because there's work to be done. Why do we have youth groups that meet every Wednesday night? Because there's work to be done. I'm afraid that, and you all can attest to this, because you all have experienced this just as I have. There has been a culture created in America, this Americanized Christianity, that is not genuine Christianity that we find in the Scripture. We have people who profess Christ that are only Sunday morning Christians. And they're no more invested in the gospel. Listen, whatever you find the most joy in is what you're going to be the most invested in. Whatever you find the most joy in is what you're going to be the most invested in. But we have people who profess Jesus that are not invested in the work of the ministry. That is contrary to Scripture. That is not biblical Christianity. Paul was no superhuman. Peter was no superhuman. The apostles were not superhuman. They were ordinary people just like you and I who were invested in the gospel. Why? Because they had been transformed by the gospel. A life transformed by the gospel is one that becomes invested in the gospel. That's why Jesus left his disciples with the Great Commission. To go ye therefore. In other words, as you go, as you live your life, tell others. Tell others. And here is the encouraging thing that Jesus left with them. He said, you ain't going to be alone in this. I'm going to empower you. I'm going to equip you. He says, I have all authority and all power. And I'm going to equip you to do what I'm calling you to do. If you're not invested in the gospel, get invested. Why? Because we all know people that need Jesus. I need him every single day of my life, but I'm so thankful he has transformed my eternity. Why should I be invested in the gospel? Because I have family members, if they were to die today, they would go to hell. And I know that. Why should you be invested? Because there's people around you every day that don't know Jesus. They don't know the transformation power of the gospel. Why should this church be invested in the community and the surrounding communities in the world? Because there's people that need to know the gospel. Why was Paul so invested? Because the gospel had transformed his heart and he knew that God had called him to share this message of eternity with people. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He, made, he came to make dead people alive. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. But because of the glorious gospel of Jesus, He has made us alive. And that's why He calls each and every one of our, the believers of Christ to be invested in the work of the ministry because we're around people every single day that are dead in their trespasses and sins that need to be made alive. Will you be invested in the work of the ministry? A life, a heart, a soul that has been transformed by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ will be a soul that is invested in the work of the gospel. Let's go back to the quote that we started with. Alistair McGrath, this theologian, this defender of the faith, when he read the book of Philippians, here's what he says about it. In the midst of Paul being in jail, it is one of the most positive and delightful of Paul's letters because it sets out the sheer joy of the gospel. 
That's what it's all about. See, the book of Philippians is a book of joy. Why? Because Paul's joy was rooted in the gospel. We're talking about the root of joy this morning. What does this word root mean? Most of you all would know this. A root is the part of a plant which attaches it to the ground or to a support, conveying water and nourishment for the rest of the plant. A root is also the basic cause, source, or origin of something. So what is the root of a disciple's joy? What is the foundation to, a, to the joy of a follower of Jesus Christ? What is the source of our joy? What is the origin of our joy? Why do we do what we do? Where do you find your joy at? Remember what you find the most joy in is what you're going to be the most invested in. So what is the root of your joy? Well, what should it be? The gospel. The gospel. Some of you are like, man, I hear the word gospel every Sunday like a thousand times. Because that's the root of our joy. That's where we find our purpose. That's where we find God's calling in our life. It starts at the gospel. Why? Because I was dead in my trespasses and sins. And I didn't know what God wanted for my life until I was made alive by the gospel. What is the root of a disciple's joy? What should be the gospel? What I want you to notice about the gospel is that the gospel, the good news of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, the gospel gives us a different perspective over our circumstances. <coughs> Notice Paul's different perspective. When he was writing this letter, you don't see him saying, wish I wasn't in prison. Man, this is a tough life. Why would God allow me to go through this? If God really loved me, he wouldn't let me be in prison. If God was really calling me to do this, then why am I here? We don't see this from Paul. What do we see from Paul? We see a different perspective about his circumstance. He was saying, yes, I'm in prison. Yes, this may look bad. I may face death. But hey, people are getting saved. The imperial guard of Caesar. You realize the Caesar of Rome at this time was Nero. Nero was crazy. Nero burnt half of Rome down and blamed the church. He was crazy. He hated Christians. And a man that was well known because of his faith, that was spreading the gospel, a man in prison, it didn't matter his circumstance. He went to the imperial guard of Caesar, the secret service of Nero, and was preaching the gospel to him. Imagine the other people he was in the jail cell with. Imagine the other prisoners. They probably got tired of Paul. Because what was, what was Paul talking about with them? The gospel. So Paul had a different perspective about his circumstance. So how can I maintain joy in my circumstance? How can I maintain the same joy that we find in Paul in the midst of my circumstance? None of us are physically in prison right now, are we? We're here, we're free. But some of you are in the prison of your mind. Some of you are in bondage. Some of you have some things going on in your life that you don't want anybody to know about. You don't feel comfortable sharing. You have family drama. Your finances are not going great. Your marriage is kind of rocky. You don't know how to connect with your kids. You feel like a failure as a parent. You feel like a failure as a family member, as, some, as a church member. You feel like a failure at your job. You're in the midst of a bad circumstance. How can I maintain joy in my circumstance? Here's what I see in Paul. I can maintain joy in my circumstance when I remember my purpose and my position in Christ. When I remember my purpose and my position in Christ. We all have purpose. We're all still here. In verse number 6 of the same chapter, here's what Paul says. He says this, verse number six, I am sure of this, 
that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So when you remember your purpose, you remember God has given me a purpose. He has a calling on my life and I want to walk in it. You begin to remember who you are in Jesus. You're more than your circumstance. You're more than what people say you are. You're who Jesus says you are. Your identity doesn't come from your circumstance. Your identity does not come from anybody else but your creator. So when I remember my purpose, that God has me here on purpose, I'm not an accident, I'm here by divine providence, by the sovereignty of God, then I can remember that I can maintain joy in my circumstance because of my purpose, but also because of my position in Christ. Remember, Paul has this internal conflict, I want to be with Jesus. Did you know when you got saved, when you placed your faith in Jesus, not only were you made alive, but the Bible teaches us that we are seated in heavenly places. You see, from God's view, we're there. Ephesians 2, 4, and 6, Paul talks about because of God's mercy, that we are made alive through the gospel because we're saved by grace and are seated in heavenly places. So Paul remembered this. He remembered that if he was to live, he's devoting his life to Christ. But he remembered where he was seated at. Because if he were to die in prison, and ultimately Paul goes on and he is beheaded for his faith, he dies a martyr's death. He remembered that because of his faith, because of what Jesus had done for him, he said, dying is all the more to gain because I'm going to be with my Savior. So when I remember my purpose that God has placed on my life, and I remember my position, that I'm going to go on and be with my Savior, the circumstances will come and they'll fade, but they won't dictate my joy because of what Jesus has done for me, who I am in Jesus, and where I'm at because of Jesus. But also this, when I remember that God is able to take my circumstance to use as a platform to further his kingdom. So not only can I maintain joy in the midst of my circumstance, when I remember my purpose and my position in Christ, but when I remember that God is able to take me right where I'm at, even in the midst of a bad circumstance, to set me up, to use as a platform to further his kingdom. Remember what Paul says in verses 12 through 18 that Brother Edge has been preaching on these last couple weeks. He's saying, yes, I'm in prison, but the gospel is being advanced. <laughs> yes, people may be preaching the gospel out of ill intent, but the gospel is still being advanced. So Paul says, I can maintain my joy because God is using my circumstance to give me a more effective platform to spread the gospel to more people. So think about where you're at right now. What circumstance you may be going through. If you would allow the Lord to work through you, He can use that as a platform for you to share the gospel with more people. Well, you don't understand what I'm going through. I may not. God does. And if you would allow Him to, you can reach more people with where you're at. When I was a teenager, I was at church camp at Camp Canaan down in Nancy, Kentucky, a junior camp. I was, a, I was a camp counselor for little kids. And during that week of junior camp, we got news that my grandma had passed away. My dad's mother. It was just a couple years after my dad had passed away. And there was a lot of stuff going on in my family, so it was a bad situation, but my grandma had passed away while I was at church camp. And I remember the camp director, Brother Noah Broughton, great man of God, he came and pulled me to the side and he began to encourage me. He began to speak life to my heart. And he says, Bo, and this has stuck with me since he, since he said this. I, I've taken this with me everywhere I go. He said, Bo, what you go through, the circumstances you face in life, will be your greatest ministry. 
what you go through, God can take and use, and it'll be your greatest ministry. That's what I want to speak to you all this morning. What you've went through in your life, what you may be going through now, or what you're fixing to go through, can be your greatest ministry. Are you invested in the gospel? And if you are, then realize this. That the life of a disciple is not easy, is it? Anybody who's walked with Jesus any time can attest to that. And sometimes when we face obstacles in life, when we face, face circumstances, we automatically assume this is the devil attacking me. And sometimes it is. Sometimes it is our enemy that's attacking you. But why does God allow the circumstance to happen in your life? Sometimes it's to point us back to Him. There's a lie that's been sold to many people. And it's a lie that has tragic effect on people. It's the lie that whenever you turn your life to Jesus, everything is going to be good. Now, why is this a tragic lie? Because when people believe this, as soon as something bad happens, they turn away. We wonder why so many people are turning away from the church. They've been sold this lie. So sometimes when we face circumstances, sometimes it is the devil on the attack. We have a great enemy. He's as the lion, seeking whom he may devour. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But why does God allow these things? It's not always the devil on the attack. Sometimes it's God using this circumstance to get you to focus back on Him. Some of you where you're at right now with your family, you feel like, man, I, I don't connect to my family anymore. It's like all we do is argue. Maybe God's allowing that to happen because you need to turn back to Him. You've taken your eyes off of Him for far too long. You're trying to figure this thing out on your own. And realize this, that God can take you right where you're at in your circumstance. Point you back to Him so that you can make Him more known. Are you pointing people right now to Jesus in your life? How invested are you in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'll end with this. I got a buddy a few years ago. I don't remember how long ago exactly, but he went to China. He's in this room right now. His name's Isaac Tucker. He went to China. He served over in China for a little while. What did he do? He was a smuggler. He smuggled some stuff. What was it? Bibles. He smuggled Bibles from China. If you know anything about China, the practice of faith is frowned upon. Be locked in prison for preaching the gospel. Isaac, along with the team, would go to these villages, these churches, help church leaders, and they would smuggle in Bibles. Listen, we are very blessed in this country. Every one of us, the majority of all of us, probably own a few copies of God's Word that just sit on shelves and collect dust. That's another sermon, sorry. But these people in China, these Christians, what is it? A few thousand people would share just a few copies of God's Word. And these church leaders have very limited resources because... Their government tells you, you can't worship, you can't practice your faith. And a lot of these people that Isaac met had been locked in prison, and as soon as they got out, what did they start doing? They began to preach the gospel again. They're like, my circumstance is not going to affect what God is calling me to do. And I remember Isaac was telling me about being in China, and how these people would gather as the church. They would go, like in these apartment buildings, and gather to worship. To sing songs, praising the Lord for their salvation. You've got to understand this. That it's dangerous in China. One person calls in the authorities. Everybody may be getting locked up. 
But did they allow that to hinder their worship? Did they allow that to hinder them from preaching the gospel? No. Why? Because their joy was the gospel. Their true worship was them offering themselves as a living sacrifice to the work of the ministry for the glory of the Lord. There's a video I watched one time. I shared it on our church page a month or so ago. And there's this guy talking about the Chinese church. And he was going and visiting. He was helping out, trying to give resources to church leaders. And his, his visit was concluding. They were at this service. And one of the church members come up and ask him, and they say, will you pray for us? Just pray. He replies and says, specifically, what, what can I pray for you about? And they say, that we can become more like you. That we can be like the American church because you guys can freely gather to worship. You all have multiple copies of God's Word. I bet you guys just dive in and study. You all know so much because you have so many resources. You can freely gather. I'm sure your worship services are awesome. And he looks at them and he says, I can't do that. I cannot pray that prayer. And they say, Why? Why can't you pray this for us? The guy replies and he says, Because you guys don't need to be more like us. We need to be more like you. You are limited to what you can do. You all are risking your life just to gather to worship. Not everybody owns a copy of God's Word, but yet you know God's word more than a lot of church people that have been raised in church their whole lives. So my prayer is not that you all become more like us, but that we become more like you because you don't allow your circumstance to dictate your joy. You do not allow your circumstance to dictate your worship. That's my prayer for each and every one of us this morning. Don't allow your circumstance to hinder your joy. Paul had a shift in his perspective. His perspective was not in his circumstance, but it was in his calling. He knew God's calling in his life. He knew what he should have been doing. He knew that he was called to preach the gospel. That's the calling on each and every one of our lives. With so many of us, when something goes wrong, we become so fixated on what's wrong and we neglect the fact that God could be setting you up a platform to reach more people with the gospel. So I'll ask you again this morning, where's your joy? Where does your joy come from? Because that's where you're going to be the most invested in. So what do you spend the most time doing? What do you spend the most time thinking about? Man, there's a Super Bowl game coming up, right? Have you become so invested in that that you've neglected the gospel? What about your work? What about your family? Have you become so invested in your family that you're neglecting the gospel? Your job? Your hobbies? Sports? Fishing? Hunting? What are you invested in the most? That's where your joy's coming from. But listen, that's going to fade. When your joy is found in the gospel, when your joy is rooted in Jesus, He's eternal, He's never changing, He is a firm foundation. So the root of joy in the life of a disciple is the gospel. And when that becomes the root of your joy, that's what you're going to become more invested in. So my prayer this morning, just like the prayer of that man I told you about, with the Chinese church, that we can become more like that. That we don't allow our circumstances to hinder us from our worship, from the spreading of the gospel. Because when we view things from the lens of the gospel, we see a change in perspective. God could be setting you up as a platform to be more effective in spreading His word to other people. Father, I love you this morning. God, I want to thank you for this day. Thank you for... This message, Lord, I hope it made sense. God, you began to speak to my heart as I prepared. And 
Lord, I, I began to search myself. Where was my joy in? God, I see in my life so many times that I become invested in so many other things that hinder my work for the gospel. I put other things above you, and Lord, for that I repent, I turn. God, help us to be rooted in the gospel because it's the gospel that sets prisoners free. It's the gospel that makes dead people alive. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but because of your great love for us, you offer this free gift of salvation. And that if we would accept it, you make us alive. And Lord, when you do that, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 2, verse 10, that after we've accepted your gospel, we've accepted your grace, that we become your workmanship, we become your masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for the work of the ministry. So Lord, help us not to live contrary to the scriptures, but God, help us to live biblical, authentic lives. Not being Sunday morning only Christians, but to be sold out and invested in the work of the ministry. Circumstances will come, circumstances will fade, but Lord, you never change. You're never ending. Your love for us is great. Your mercy never ends. So Lord, help us to remember that when our foundation is you, it's firm and it's true. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.